Hello there everyone, welcome to another video on the channel and welcome to some Womble Leader Gran Turismo 7 Science Corner where we're going to try and do our very best to test something called dirty air in Gran Turismo 7 when we have real slipstream on. Now if you're not aware what dirty air is, essentially put as a race car with wings and aero packages goes through the air, the air goes over the car, pushes the car into the ground but that air as it goes over the car and out the back of the car comes out in a disturbed fashion and if there happens to be a car close behind that car then when that air hits their car their aerodynamic package does not work as effectively because the air is disturbed and they lose grip at the front which can lead to understeer and it's commonly referred to as dirty air in motor racing it's been a problem that's blighted motorsport for a very long time probably since sort of large rear wings and front wings etc came in to motor racing categories I guess in the 70s in Formula 1 and maybe a little bit later in kind of sports car categories and it's definitely something that can rear its ugly head in Gran Turismo 7 when real slipstream is applied. Now it's most noticeable in categories with high downforce so in Gran Turismo 7 that's kind of from group 2 and above so group 2, group 1, Super Formula X2019 to name a few. Now some people do complain about dirty air in group 3, in my opinion it's not that much of an issue, some people will disagree with that and that's fine, however Gran Turismo 7 and Polyphony Digital's somewhat inelegant solution to the dirty air is something called custom slipstream. Now if you know anything about me and anything about the channel you will know I've been a long time kind of complainer about custom slipstream and the effect it's had on the racing. Basically makes the slipstream about 60 to 70% stronger, completely eliminates the dirt air and even to the extent where I now think it you know, almost drags you through the corners. So in this video I want to take a look at real slipstream and explore exactly what it's doing in the game. Is it a myth because some people don't believe in it? Is it as bad as people make out and possibly you know what can we do to minimise the effects of it? So the test for this one well, the methodology for the test is pretty simple. I was going to get into a high downforce car, in this case the Porsche 962 from Group 1, find a corner where we could go through it full throttle, and then adjust the car so that we were pretty much on the limit of grip when we went through the corner in clean air. So in this first example, we are in the Group 1 Porsche 962 with 621 brake horsepower, Downforce set to minimum levels of 500 and 1000 and we're going through Eau Rouge at Spa. And you can see me going through the corner several times here in clean air to see how easy it is to get through this corner at full throttle. Now, it's not too far off on most of the examples here but you can see we are having a little bit of problems with the track limits. However, eventually, as this run demonstrates here, we get through the corner full throttle with those car settings, no penalty, we know we can get through the corner at full throttle in clean air. So if dirty air is as bad as people make out in high downforce cars, it should stand to reason when we follow a high, high downforce car through Eau Rouge with these settings, going through full throttle should be impossible. So the test for this one was we kind of had an X2019 start behind us, and because they're a little bit quicker than it's got a little bit better grip and acceleration as we get down to Eau Rouge here in the first example we're about what seven temps behind them if we get a big waft of dirty air here then it should be quite difficult but in this example we seem to easily get through Eau Rouge here even though we're in the dirty air so example number two we do seem to kind of get a little bit understeer mid corner there but enough to keep the car within the track limit so no actually half second penalty i'm telling porky pies uh, we tried another few examples here we'll just fast forward through these you can see that in most of the instances we either go wide at the top of the hill or we pick up a penalty but we're not having a great deal of trouble following this x2019 through the corner like you would expect us to if, you know if dirty air was that bad then we should be washing out However, it doesn't really seem to be the case, but I kind of came to the conclusion that this test was maybe just a little bit flawed. First point is we are running minimum downforce on the car, so maybe the dirt air doesn't have the same effect. The second one was because it's uphill going through Eau Rouge, were we actually missing the dirt air? Was it going above the car? So I decided I would try and find a better example. That takes us on to test number two. We're actually going to Blue Moon Bay and reverse the oval track 
We're still in the Porsche 962. We're going to go through turn 1 with 690 brake horsepower and the downforce at 622 in the front and 1325 on the rear. And going through turn 1, we're on the intermediate tyres as well, I should mention. And with the car set up like this on these tyres, I found that we were pretty much able to get through turn 1 just on the limit there. We're just getting right up to the wall, but we could get through turn 1 full throttle with these settings pretty cleanly, but not every single time. So you can see a few examples here. If we didn't get the line quite right, or if we didn't get the steering angle quite right, the car would drift wide and go into the wall. So, we could get through full throttle, but it certainly wasn't a guarantee. So that told me, well, okay then, if that's the car we're pretty much on the limit, let's follow another Porsche 962 and see if we can basically with these same settings in the dirt air of another Porsche, can we get through turn one at full throttle? So first test there, first try at it, turns out to be a bit of a failure. Second test here, now we are pretty close to the car in front, much closer than we were at Spa, just two attempts behind the car in front. And again, you can see the car just, as we get into the mid part of the corner, it just kicks out there with the understeer. And that was pretty much repeatable. We could do that pretty much every time. That seemed to be the case. We lost the front end of the car and into the wall we went. And another couple of examples here. Again, that one was probably the worst one of the lot. And another example here as well. You can see the car just drifts out and into the wall we go. So I was pretty satisfied with that test. I was like, okay, yep. Yeah. The dirt air is definitely having a negative effect on the car there. But how much do we now have to adjust our driving to get through this corner? whilst in the dirt air of the car in front, and it was just a tiny little lift. So a little bit of adaptation, a little bit of understanding of what the car would be doing in that situation, and we were able to get through the corner without really too much of an issue. It kind of got me further thinking as well though. How much downforce do I need to add to the car to now put myself in the same situation and get through that corner full throttle? So I did 25 points of downforce to the front, 25 points of downforce to the rear, and went back into the test once again. So with a little bit more downforce, maybe arriving at the corner half a mile an hour slower, was that increase in downforce now enough to get the car through the corner at full throttle whilst in the dirt air of the car in front? And voila. Now, I don't really know what to take from that. It doesn't seem like a massive difference or a whole lot more downforce has been added to the car to kind of mitigate that dirty air effect. I'm certainly not saying that uh, dirty air only loses you 50 points of downforce on the car, but maybe it does. Let me know what you think about that in the chat. But yeah, I was quite satisfied with that test. I think we kind of satisfiedly showed that dirty air definitely had a negative effect and really kind of showed, you know, exactly the, the impact it has on the car when you're going through a fast corner. We're going to move on to test number three, because We've basically just been testing one corner, so let's now actually test a kind of race situation. Again, we're still in the Porsche 962 and we're at Suzuka and we are on the BOP for the track. So that's 690 brake horsepower, 750 downforce on the front, 1500 points on the rear. And we're basically going to do sectors 1 and 2 of Suzuka because they're all very fast corners, connecting corners. And if dirt air is going to have an effect when you're following another car, sectors 1 and 2 at Suzuka probably might be the worst kind of one minute of track you could probably pick. So the test was pretty simple. We were going to basically do sectors 1 and 2 in clean air about 10, 11, 12 times until we got a really good satisfactory time. We were quite convinced, you know, we're putting a pretty representative time. So you can see we're just gradually improving down to a 47.8 as we come under the bridge. 47.6 and finally maybe around about the 10th run here this was probably our best run of them all well actually it was definitely our best run of them all so we are going to go and do I think it's a 46.3 or a 47.3 I think it's a 47.3 that we do when we get to the end so yeah the test was pretty simple now let's kind of repeat the test in the dirty air of another Porsche 962 with Sophie driving because they're pretty good through the first sector at uh, Suzuka and if the dirty air is having the impact or such a horrendous impact as the way some people make out now my opinion to be honest with you is yes it is an issue it's annoying 
but you can deal with it, you can follow, it's hard to get close to another car to overtake it, but you definitely can follow, so yeah, 47-3 there as we come through the second sector. So if we do the same test now behind another car, then we shouldn't be able to get anywhere near that 47-3. Now, for anybody wondering, the fact that we're now behind another car doesn't actually impact the sector one and two times because the timer for our lap actually starts at precisely the same moment. It just actually moves the cars around you. No matter where you start the race, you still your timer still starts as you cross the line. I did double check that several times over just to make sure that was the case. So we come to the end of sector one there into sector two. And you can see Sophie's pulled up at 1.3 seconds ahead of us. We're still getting a bit of dirty air. And look, no denying it, you can definitely feel it. You know, the car is not quite as responsive coming into the the sequence of fast left and right corners through sector one. 481 being our first time, 480 on our next attempt. We kind of gradually start to bring that down to 47.8, so we're about half a second off our best time, a 47.7. So we're getting a little bit faster with each run, but not getting anywhere near that kind of uh, 47.3 that we did in the clean air, a 47.8. Uh, but you know, I decided, you know what, let's actually, let's actually try and make it even a little bit more difficult. Let's actually make ourselves, let's put ourselves closer to Sophie as we go into turn one because, as I said, they're pretty good through sector one at uh, Suzuka and they are on medium tyres as well so they kind of were pulling a little bit of a gap out as the two sectors went on so I kind of went into the settings, reduced the gap down to make us a lot closer to Sophie as we came through the first sector. Now that does mean we get a lot of slipstream down into turn one of course and, uh, but we are going to be closer as we come through this sector here. So we really should be struggling through here, you know, the way people go on about the dirty air, you know, we should just be, the car should be undrivable, shouldn't it? But you can see, I can definitely feel it, but I, and I, as long as I adjust to it, as long as I'm just making sure the front end of the car gets in and concentrating on the exit of the corners, we can definitely follow the car in front. Coming into the Degners now here, Degner 2, we're pretty close to Sophie here, about half a second as we came out, it's been a pretty good run, that was a 47.7, we then were able to pretty much replicate that time with the next one, and this was going to be our last run, I decided let's have one more go, and this is going to be our fastest run of them all, it's not going to be dramatically faster than the ones we've just done, and spoilers, it's another 47.7, I think. Uh, so yeah, kind of proves the point though, that in the dirty air of a car in front, as expected and as people say, we don't quite have the same performance as we do in clean air. But four temps in these high downforce cars through the first couple of sectors of Suzuka, which might be, as far as I can tell, maybe the worst section of track to be behind another car in the dirty air, like four temps is not like huge not absolutely massive and then remember Suzuka we're coming on to the second part of the track where the slipstream is going to start helping us a little bit uh, as we come on to the long drag up the spoon and then down to 130R so that's the trade-off between dirty air and slipstream or the way it should be anyway you know you lose a little bit in the corners you gain a little bit in the straights the problem with custom slipstream is you gain a lot on the straights and you gain a little bit in the corners uh, and all the advantage goes to the car behind uh, and I'm not a fan of it at the end of the day, but yeah, this was quite an interesting test, certainly kind of confirmed my kind of position on the dirt here with real slipstream. You definitely feel it, it's definitely there, it's definitely real, but it's not as big an issue as a lot of people make out. So why has dirty air become such a sore point in the game when running real slipstream? Why is there so much complaining about it now compared to what there used to be? There did used to be the odd mention of it, but it certainly gets a lot more heat now than what it ever used to. Well, I think there is a couple of reasons for that. The first reason is that when custom slipstream was first introduced to the game, and I think it really came to prominence in the Trial Mountain race in the sort of production souped up road cars, a lot of people just seen the positives of it and never really understood the negatives until much further down the line. A lot of people have kind of now started to realise that custom slipstream is maybe an overall negative, but initially 
people were blinded by the close racing, the, the chaotic racing, the easy overtakes, being able to kind of keep up with drivers that were much faster than you, being able to have close races all the way to the last corner of the last lap. Now, not to blow my own trumpet, but at the time, I was probably the only YouTube content creator out there expressing the negatives of Custom Slipstream. I understood why people liked it, but I was very clear in saying that I think this is going to end up ruining the game. However, most other people out there doing the content were waxing lyrical about how amazing Custom Slipstream is, the close racing is amazing, how exciting it was, and I don't know who PD listened to, maybe it's nobody, but unfortunately my prophetic words of be careful what you wish for seems to have come true because Custom Slipstream is now pretty much the default setting in daily races and also for quite a lot of GTWS races and somewhat ironically many of the people out there who were praising Custom Slipstream, wishing for Custom Slipstream and more races are now vehemently against it and complaining about it pretty much constantly. What can I say? So to get to my point and I have taken a little bit of a detour to get here but the point is that we've now had a prolonged period of custom slipstream and so when we do get a race that's got real slipstream people are probably doubly shocked by the, the, the dirt air they've got so used to not having any kind of front grip loss at all in the corners that when we do get a race that's got real slipstream the attack dogs come out about the complaints about the dirt air they completely forget about all the things that they've been complaining about in regards to custom slipstream and they just go straight back to complaining about the dirty air and so PD if they do actually listen to anyone or anything if they kind of see all these complaints about the dirty air then as we said very early in the video the inelegant solution to that is the custom slipstream and then all the problems that that then brings. So I think that's why Dirty Air has been getting so much heat, so much complaint time over the last year from the GT7 community or the sport mode community to be probably more precise. But I think as we've shown in the video that whilst Dirty Air is very much a thing and whilst it certainly can have an effect on the car is maybe not quite this evil demon in the game that people sort of make it out to be certainly in my opinion but we'll pretty much leave it there I have spoken for the best part of 18 minutes now, you must be very fed up with my voice if you've made it to this point but I really do appreciate you watching comment below, constructive criticism, always welcome, agree, disagree it's all good, let's chat about this issue of dirt air in the game thank you very much for watching folks I'll catch you on the next one, goodbye now